Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to the third edition of ICAN. This is a special session titled War Mongering in News Industry. Before I move forward, I would like you to orient with ICAN 3, which is titled as Issues of Community Agenda in News, which is being hosted by most promising media institute of India, DME Media School. It is the world's first 10-day digital live international conference being held from June 21st to June 30th, 2020. We have total 29 sessions, which includes 14 technical sessions, three panel discussions, three plenary sessions, three master classes, and two special sessions, including this one. It gives me immense pleasure to announce that we have received 202 abstracts, 141 papers, and have published and have conceptualized six books, five English and one in Hindi wherein 174 authors have contributed. All books are available on Amazon. Links are available in the chat box. Uh, sir, would you like to run the uh, teaser? Prithik, sir. I shall continue. We are thankful to our knowledge partners, Adamas University, Kolkata, KR Mangalam University, Gurugram, APJ Institute of Mass Communication, New Delhi, Deakin University, Australia, Public Relations Society of India, PRSI, Delhi Chapter, and our media partner of other conferences, The Policy Times. Thank you for the coverage. This is the third edition of ICANN. The first edition, India and Changing Aspects of News, was organized in March 2018. And the second edition, Indian Cinema and Alternate Networks, ICANN, was held in November 2018. ICANN 3 is being organized by Delhi Metropolitan Education, which is an A-grade premier educational institute affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh in the Press University, New Delhi, and approved by Bar Council of India. The institute offers BBA, BALLB, BBLLB with BCI approval and BAJMC programs. It believes in imparting world-class education to its students while training them to develop and enhance their skills. This education and training enables them in taking up challenges of the industry and creating a space for themselves with their competence and vigor. For all the information related to ICAN3, please follow and like our ICAN3 social media, Facebook and Instagram pages. All the sessions of ICAN3 are available on Facebook page, ICAN3 playlist and YouTube DME TV channel. Also, ICAN3 is, available, is on LinkedIn where there are 400 plus connections, all researchers, academicians, VCs, Dean HODs from the university, from university of colleges and abroad. Make sure to connect on ICAN3 LinkedIn page. A great place for networking and building a community for academic excellence and adding value on earth we live in. ICAN3 also has a web page. You can get all relevant resources from there, like links from where you can get the ICAN3 books, video playlist, all the reference material, ICAN3 proceedings, souvenir and everything. So stay connected with this. Hashtag conference for change. Now I would like to uh, welcome you to today's session. It is very special as we have amongst us renowned journalist Miss Betty Dam. She is a famous investigative journalist and has made a career in journalism working in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. At the age of 29, she published her first book about Afghanistan. The Dutch newspaper called her a top journalist. An English version quickly followed a man and a motorcycle, how Hamid Karazi came to power. It was journalism that brought her to Afghanistan, where she entered a new world that she quickly felt at home in. She sat around the table with NATO generals. She entertained top-level officials in her Kabul house, wrote a book about the president, and eventually assumed the most difficult journalistic job, talking to terrorists. Her book is about one of the mis most mysterious people in the war against terror, Mullah Omar, the leader of Taliban. Some call her the carry of the famous web series, Homeland. Ms. Betty Dam found Mullah Omar's hideout, something the CIA had not been able to do. The CIA had lost track of him and were not able to locate Mullah Omar. Various film and documentaries had documented her work on terrorism in the Taliban heartlands of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Her views on the war on terror in sought after. Ms. Betty Dan is a lecturer at Science Po in Paris, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. She regularly contributes as an expert on political discussion programs on Al Jazeera, Huffington Post Life, and Paw and Whitman. She is often interviewed by CNN, BBC, and ABC. Ms. Bette Dam shares her unique journalistic approach by lecturing at universities, NGOs, state, universe, state department, the Pentagon, and international organizations. The independent lens through which she reports has inspired a new generation of journalists to trust their intuition. It is her intuition that has guided her through some of the most dangerous terrain imaginable, resulting in cutting-edge independent, impartial reporting 
that breaks stories not found anywhere. Thank you so much, ma'am. It is indeed our honor to have you here. Looking forward to an insightful session ahead. We are also we will be also joined by Ibrahim Truhi. He is also a journalist. He will give us a first-hand account of happenings in Afghanistan, up, along with ma'am. And we have amongst us Dr. Amrit Saxena, Dean DME Media School, and Dr. Susmita Bala, HOD DME Media School. Miss Betty Dam would like to demonstrate her work with us on the topic followed by Ibrahim Truhi. who will also engage us with presentation related to the topic and post the floor will be open for questions so please write all your questions in the chat box the session will be moderated by dr amrit saxena dean dm media school and i will also be helping assisting sir before we proceed with bete ma'am's presentation i would like uh, dr amrit saxena to please say a few words uh thank you yashasika for uh, giving the complete uh, account of the, this uh, icon and then uh, today's session, session as you have already mm, uh, told everybody i will simply add very few words few lines to that in uh, dme media school we completely work with the difference there are so many media institutions all across the world and incidentally if i can tell betty dam I mean me and dr suspita wala we we keep on traveling a lot all around the world attending the conferences the communication and research conferences and the journalism conferences only last year there was a conference of uh, this world journalist uh, council uh, which happened in paris around the same time in the month of july we were there and before that there was a very big conference of iamcr last year only that that was in madrid so now we have a fairly good account as to what is happening as far as journalism is concerned in other parts of the world and since uh, uh, betty you have been uh, working in developing countries in afghanistan and iraq so these are the countries which more or less like uh, india this uh, asian part of the world uh, and this is completely different from you europe and the us i mean not only the countries are different but obviously the social life and the, the journalism is also different so uh, obviously we believe that uh, since you come from that stream of journalism and you have been working on the ground so we will be able to catch all such insight which i mean not only me but my fellow journalists my fellow media educators and researchers in india and also the students i mean they they might not be having that much understanding because uh, what we have uh, i mean since uh, what i have uh, read about the kind of journalist you have uh, and uh, what uh, your thinking is reflected in your work so uh, we in india i mean india and all such other countries in the developing world they are completely influenced by the western media in in politics also in mm. media also we subscribe whatever is coming from europe and the united states and uh, in india is not in good relation with uh, pakistan india is not in good relations with china india is also not good relations though it's a very latest development with nepal and then whatever we know i mean we indians anybody any indian citizen living in india whatever we know about pakistan or china we look from the, the the indian perspective and then the western media perspective the the news agencies of the west which always present a distorted picture to us and we are never able to know what is actually happening on the ground and what are actually the issues and why the issues are not being resolved after 70 years our whole political system take us for a ride and we are never uh, ne never have access to the genuine reliable information since you have been deep into that so i believe you will be able to tell us all in this uh, session and the basic objective with which we organize this i can since uh, you have been in touch with us for the last many months when we were organizing the conference in the month of march and we requested you to come over and uh, uh, make a presentation here but obviously the everything mm -hmm. got top service since that time in the entire world and this covid 19 has uh, has affected our lives so much then we are not following that convention but then there is a good part to that that we are able to catch you up even if you are not traveling to india but you are able to address us all and to speak on on such issues which 
each one of us eager to listen. So uh, I will request you uh, uh, to start your presentation. But before that, I will also request my colleague, uh, Professor Susmita Bala, who is head of DME Media Institute, to say a few words and then you please uh, take over. Professor Bala. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Just be a little louder, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, Betty Day is a symbol of women power. She is a journalist who has done remarkable work. I welcome her in this special session. I hope all journalists, professionals, media educators, and researchers will be benefited by her talk. Welcome, ma'am, in Indian audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, shall we start with the presentation? Yes. Yes, shall we? <clears throat> Ritika, please give rights to Betty, ma'am. Yeah, I've already given. OK, ma'am. Share the screen. Do you have, are you facing any difficulty? I am not. I, are you waiting for me? Yes, yes, yes sure. ma'am. For the ah, presentation, okay. for share, sharing the screen. Of course, of yes. course. Do you want to uh, give a presentation? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> um, there is the presentation. Um, well, yeah, I'm so really happy to do this after all. Really happy to have so many people on the other side of the screen, I would say. Uh, I cannot see you, but I know you're there, uh, which is beautiful. Um, we are going to talk about my favorite topic, which is journalism. Uh, I love it. I have been a journalist from my 18th year, and I don't want to do anything else, uh, I hope, in the future. I'm not alone today. Um, Sorry, I'm going to make some messages. Um, I'm not alone today. I uh, am uh, at the moment um, uh, starting to find like uh, inspiring uh, like colleagues who also join me in the project that I have started um, recently here in Brussels, which is an outcome of all my journalistic work, which is basically to come with a plan of improving this Western journalism about the war on terror. Um, that is basically the end stage where I am right now. Um, I, I will tell you why I ended up here and why do I want to improve journalism. Basically, I want um, journalism to be journalism again. I think, in especially on coverage on war, uh, foreign affairs, war on terror, uh, there, are, uh, there are worrying situations uh, at the moment. Now, I will tell you a little bit about my experience, indeed, uh, in the last 15 years, mainly in the war on terror in Afghanistan, um, and how we actually use sources as journalists. This is the very core point of my, my work at the moment. Who do we talk to? Why do we talk to them? How do we talk to them? And why do we give this voice a stage and not this voice? What are the selections for that? Um, uh, I will tell you a little bit about the big newspapers, so the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Reuters AP, because simply if we wake up in the morning, it is them who decide the agenda of the world. Uh, everyone also in my country, when we have news desk meetings in the early morning, we open up the New York Times and say, okay, we also need to do something like this. We cannot miss this. So there's a lot of copy paste behavior. 
uh, so that's why I'm focusing basically on those big newspapers. Um, Ibrahim Turial is with me, is also listening in now from Sydney. It's much later there. And so he might step out a little bit earlier um, to get some rest. And uh, Ibrahim is an, a, an, a researcher based in Australia, uh, originally from Afghanistan. And we found each other on this sourcing uh, criticism, basically. And he will tell you like, about one particular source, which is the UN. And he gives you an analysis of what, what if you ha get this, this UN reports on your desk, on your news desk, about civilian casualties, about whatever. How do you treat them? Um, and, and, and so on. So uh, that's what we are going to do in two hours, I hope. So I will do a quick introduction of, of what I experienced and then Ibrahim as well. And then we hopefully have more questions from the moderators or from anybody. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So I want to t start my personal journey, which was basically um, uh, the first time I went to Afghanistan was 2006. And you have to imagine, I come from the Netherlands, from a small village where we read the mainstream media. And I left the Netherlands with the idea of this military intervention in Afghanistan that was trying to fight terrorism, that was trying to fight terrorism over there to make it at home safe, basically. I was looking up at the idea of the US doing this. I was basically, I am from a very pro-US family. Uh, and so for me, when I did this in 2006, I, I thought it was necessary. So what I did is in going on an embed. Uh, embed means you travel with the army, the NATO member states. In this case, it was the Dutch military. That means that I was going with them because in the Netherlands, which is just a small country, but in many ways comparable to the US, 90% of the journalists did go embedded only. So basically we took a plane, a big plane full of soldiers and me in a little bit of khaki clothes with the vest and a helmet ready. And we flew to the other side of the world and we landed here. What you see here is a 10,000 people big camp. This is in Kandahar, south of Afghanistan. There is everything. There's a beautiful Starbucks coffee. You can eat lobster. You can also have like a, a play hockey if you want, because it's all there. The streets are nicely decorated with asphalt. You, when you arrive, the plane goes like this. It goes up and down and you need to throw up immediately because who can deal with a plane who flies, flies like that? And then the general will tell you the most important message. We are flying like this because in Afghanistan there is terrorism and it's called Taliban and Al Qaeda and we are gonna solve this problem. And they are very aggressive and that's why we fly like this because the rockets come from everywhere and so we need to protect you. It's very intimidating. If you are, I was, like many war journalists are very young. I was 26, I think. You are uh, surrounded by this machinery of an arm. All medals, titles, and abbreviations. Lots of abbreviations. Institutions are very good in using abbreviations. There's nothing more inaccessible than abbreviations. And they laugh at you if you do not understand them. They have the monopoly on that other language that I am not speaking. So I was completely silent. I had no idea where to go. There was portrayed to me a danger and a total inaccessibility where they automatically got the, the monopoly on knowledge. Because what am I, I, I have the newspaper and I, I am seeing this camp. Well, what do you see? Nothing. You see weapons, you see uh, helicopters down there, you see tons of, tons of, of uniforms. So that takes, for every journalist, to everyone here who wants to become a journalist, I warn you, institutions, if, if it's the EU, 
if it's the UN, if it's an army, it's a government, a foreign affairs ministry, can be so intimidating. Because they have often big buildings where you often get lost, where you need them to understand. And I feel like I learned a lot to, with this experience, and I want to share that to try to stay yourself, try to be yourself, though you're surrounded by, by this dominant situation. Now, the military, as you know, uh, the coalition against the head, the coalition that joined the war on terror to protect uh, the world from terrorism was massive. It was the biggest coalition ever from the top of my mind. Now, I, I'm not going to say, but it's the most of the world countries joined this coalition against the, uh, the terrorism. And you see, they had camps everywhere. We were just, as media, we were only hopping between Germany, you see in the north, you see Italy in Herat, you see the Americans everywhere, of course, you see here and there Turkey. Um, so that was my, um, my knowledge. If I want to understand Afghanistan, I have to understand basically our presence there. That was the way of journalism. More troops, less troops. More coalition partners, less coalition partners. More enemy, less enemy. Very black and white. Are we winning? Are we losing? So that, that, that was a constant narrative I was feeding uh, in this first embed in 2006. This was, of course, the enemy, right? Every day when I was in Afghanistan, 2006, the first time, it was headlines of the New York Times until 2014, I think. Headlines, I would see, like, I, I saw as like, and the enemy as, as monsters, as people who kill, people who use suicide, people who are impossible to talk to. If you portray them like this, um, and, and so, yeah, this is, this is what my, my picture was at the time, and probably also the picture you have of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, ISIS, or any other terrorist group. At the same time, when I was on this, this camp, I, after a couple of days, I started to get on my feet again. I was walking around, I was talking to people, I was trying to get rid of the public affairs officers who were always, you know, behind me, and I was trying to meet. And I noticed that, uh, that there was also a lot unknown. So they portrayed this picture that was behind the camp. Everything behind those big walls eh, uh, of these military camps was dangerous. You could not go there. If you would go there, you would be on your own. There was a very strong message of the military. So you would, why would you do that? I mean, that's the only source of information. But just to give, give you an example that made me, two examples that made me think. One day we were like rocketed by, by a rain of rockets flying into the camp. What happens is the alarm goes, you fall on the ground, you crawl to, to a bunker and you wait. Then the military uh, goes out, the foreign military goes out with special forces. They raise off the camp, trying to find the enemy. In that moment of the attack, Reuters, AP, me, I was also part of the latest news business. We started writing, Kandahar camp attacked again. Since last week we have three attacks, all Taliban, la la, sent. Who's first, who's first? And you're like in this media room and you want to be first. But then the soldiers came back in the evening and I was smoking still. And I was like, hey guys, what, what, what was happening actually outside? You know, I have no idea. But what did you see? Who is it? Who is it? No idea. The guy said, we never find the guys who throw a rocket on the camp. We never manage to capture them. They throw a rocket sometimes with, with a remote control even. And I was like, oh man. But I already told the world that it is Taliban. So... And I said, so, so you don't know, you had, didn't arrest anybody, you have no interviews, you have no, no whatever, intel. Or, he's like, no, 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 this is, 
no, they, they're there, that's all. So I was like, oh, right. Another time I was reporting on in a special mission, a military mission, that I had only information from the military, the Operation Medusa, I was like many Taliban killed, really many Taliban. I, uh, there's a book about specifically this mission which is called and the dogs are eating them now because the bodies were left on the street and the dogs were coming because nobody dared to pick up the bodies one soldier came to the church on the camp there's on every camp is a church and i joined him and after we we spoke with the tea and some sweets and he started crying and i'm like why are you crying and he's like that's it you know, I was in the middle of this fight and we had no idea who was, kill who was trying to kill us. We were having lunch. It was daylight. We were on this small base. We had a plastic chair, plastic, like if you're sitting in a garden and have your white sandwiches and suddenly completely controlled and attacked and they had needed helicopters to get themselves out. Two things from the story. One, they were not in control. Second, they had no idea who was shooting at them. And so I left that embed as a journalist confused. I was like, I, I, what, am I, what am I doing? I cannot do this. And Afghanistan, we were losing. Every day we were losing more and more people. And the narrative in the, in the, in the newspaper was very much, of course it was about losing people, but not about like what we were doing there. It was very military focused. Now. I want to, I, I, this is a little bit of a long introduction, but I want you to understand that 90% of the journalists lived in this. 90% of the journalists never corrected that report of not, that we don't know who is actually sh throwing rockets at, at the camp. We just don't know. Um, I spoke when I returned to the Netherlands, it, I didn't, I didn't leave me, this whole mission. Um, and so I spoke to a freelancer and you often see in this world of journalism that freelancers, good ones, pick up more freedom, they, they, they take more freedom. They have not a news editor in The Hague or in, in New York that sort of like influences them. And I feel there is more more uh, diversity in their reporting, which I applaud. Um, and she said, "Better, why don't you, for once, go alone to Afghanistan? Just, just go. I think you can. There's a flight, and you can book it. And I will call a hotel for you." And tick 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 tick, called, and a guy was picking up the phone. He was speaking fluent English. In two minutes, I had an invitation for the hotel Le Monde in Charenau. He said, I will expect you then and then tell me your flight details. I will pick you up from the airport. Then I tried to book a flight and there were at least seven civilian flights going to Kabul. Meaning the idea the military portrayed to us is like, you can only go here because it's super dangerous and you have to come with us. 90%, if not more, of the Dutch journalists said yes to that. Also, a lot of American media said yes to that. And what it turns out, that it was extremely easy to go in 2007 on my own to Kabul. It was also extremely cheap. A, a two-way ticket, Amsterdam, Kabul, was 750 euros. News desks do have that money. The hotel was $30 a night. And of course, a translator is a little bit more expensive, but it's not excessive. And, and this is what I did. And I, I just hope that the message comes across that you really have to think yourself. You have to start asking questions if you wonder. Because what happened, we had full access in Afghanistan. I was one of the two journalists who went. <laughs> We could just drive my own car. I could cycle. I could just go and hang out with the president if I wanted to, because I decided right there and then that I wanted to write a book about the president to introduce the country to the world, basically. And I had breakfast with him whenever I wanted. But not only that, we had fun too. 
there were so many foreigners in, in Kabul, for example. People from everywhere were in the, in the city. But this story wasn't out, but this is what we did. We went on the lake, we used swan boats, we got picnics every Friday. I made friends. Rangina, you see here, and her daughter, which is my informal goddaughter, she has just became the Minister of Education, but this was in Kandahar in 2008 when she was running a small NGO for widows. Uh, she helped me a lot. Now, soon enough, I sort of started tweeting about my experience and it was picked up because there is an interest in the story somehow. So in no time, I was in CNN and here you see me. And I was trying my very best and I said, I remember clearly that there was an attack and then everything goes super fast and you need to be like Superman to say, calm down. We don't know anything. We are in the middle of an explosion. It, Afghanistan and any country where there is war is super difficult and complex. So I, I, in particular, this time when I was standing in front of the Continental Hotel in Kabul that was terribly attacked, I remember I spoke to the editor in, I don't know where she was, in the US, and I said, just ask me who did this at this question and she did that and so i said to her i think we have to say we don't know because we see and i got that from all the interviews i had the freedom to do that in all the parts of the country we see that there is a lot of complexity in the enemy we see for example that um, the in terrorism the, the the terrorism is basically a theater and the war is a theater where lots of groups have an interest. So, for example, um, I want to explain to you that the first UN convoy that was attacked in Kandahar, I, I think it was 2004 or 2007, it was a UN ODC conv uh, convoy that had to do with the popium, uh, opium production. The convoy was attacked. People from the UN had died, four, I think. And it was breaking news on the whole the world. Taliban is back. Afghanistan is insecure. We need to think about more troops for this country to solve the problem. That was basically the line of thought. At that time, nobody knew and nobody investigated that actually the local minister, the local leader, Asadullah Khaled, was the head of the NDS, was behind the attack. Why? Why was the government individual behind this attack? Because the UN convoy was on its way to destroy his poppy fields, because poppy was forbidden. In order to stop that, this high-level official, who is now even more higher up in the uh, Afghan government, attacked the convoy. The UN knew, but the UN was asked not to publish the report. The report came out maybe four years later without any consequences. Another example. Often you saw like Taliban killed 10 uh, Afghans in I know a lot about the South, but you can apply this to the North as well. Every governor uh, in this country, um, and maybe in any country where there is such a massive military intervention, was asked every day, every governor of all the provinces, where is the Taliban? Where is the Taliban? Where is the Taliban? That was the, the question of these military I got to know on the basis. The governors knew the game. The governors were pinpointing to several areas to capture the Taliban. But it wasn't often the Taliban. What we did not know is that there was also internal rivalries going on where the governors got carte blanche to misuse the request of the US or the NATO to kill. One other very important point, and then I want to talk a little bit more about media, but it is very much related, is that by doing this first book on Hamid Karzai, which was about how he came to power, 
I found out something very fundamental that if you want a fundamental story that has disappeared also from our press and so from the world press basically because we are all looking at the big western medias and that is that basically the taliban i found out is a movement that is not so anti-western as we it was portrayed before 9-11, it was a movement that, that did not have such close connections to Osama bin Laden as it was portrayed, for example. It was basically a movement, very orthodox, very strict, very uneducated, very Afghan too, from certain levels of the society, that, that also wanted to talk to the West. So you have an utter differences between, you know, like the diplomats from Washington DC and these mullahs from Kandahar. That's not easy to make them talk to each other, but it was not, it is not true until today that they, the Taliban did not want to talk. Um, so you have to understand this attitude to, from the Taliban towards the world. So what happens after 9-11, you see that the support for Osama bin Laden evaporates uh, with the few Taliban that were actually supporting Al-Qaeda. There were not many. It was an, an, an alliance of convenience. I can tell you much more about this, but it's a bit too detailed. So after 9-11, the US and the British invade. They toppled the Taliban regime, and in the New York Times or the Washington Post, you will read that the Taliban is basically hiding and immediately starts an uh, insurgency again. This needs to be corrected because it's factually untrue. What happened is that after 9 11, the British and the US invade the country, toppled the regime, and Hamid Karzai reaches out to the Taliban and vice versa. They talk. It's very normal in, in conflict to talk. We forget that sometimes uh, in Washington. There is, Karzai is a very familiar with the Taliban. Not everyone, but certain some. And he makes, he appoints a, me, a mediators and so on and so on. On the 6th of December, he announces to the world media, for example, The Guardian, saying the Taliban are our brothers. They have surrendered. Al-Qaeda is the enemy. This is exactly the line of the Taliban as well, at that time. Basically what you see in the, by interviews with the Taliban, I noticed the Taliban go home. Like Mullah brother, the main negotiator at the moment for the US goes home to his village Deravut, which I happen to know very well, because you can go there if you want to. Um, so what you see is that an insurgency goes either home or they go to Pakistan. Um, and, and uh, hide there. So you basically have no enemy. So you have no enemy in 2001, you have no enemy in 2002, you have no enemy in 2003, no one in 2004, five. Those five years, the Taliban are not able to reorganize. Many are not willing. Because you see now in books like Steve Cole, he is covering that, but also Rob Grunier, Bob Grunier is a CIA special and uh, 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 Islamabad chief at that time, also tells extensively about how the Taliban over those years tried to surrender again and again. It was all denied by the US. The US could not accept the difference between Al Qaeda, second, that one of those groups would want to surrender. So you see on the 6th of December, there is this, this uh, potential deal between Karzai and the Taliban. The 7th of December, Ramsod gives a press conference and says, nothing happens against my will in Afghanistan. And that means that while there is no enemy, and if you want to explain why the conflict went off the rails in Afghanistan, this is the answer. There is no enemy for the first, first five years, but there is a doubling of troops. Every year, in five years, ten thousands of troops, how many people have they killed? And none of them, or maybe 10% of them, was Taliban. The rest was rivalry, internal rivalry, internal issues about land, water, and so on, and so on. And without having that cross-check from the US Army, but also NATO, 
they went along with that. The point here is that there was peace. Second, the peace was ignored. And what happens if you ignore the peace? You create enemies. It, I don't think I need to explain much more like in this context that we can basically as a Western media, we can just overlook a whole peace initiative, which is, which is unbelievable. Um, in 2008, when I was sitting down with the people from Karzai, they told me, but that's a, you, you do know that they surrendered. And I was like, no. And I was, uh, as a journalist, at the time, I was only in Dutch journalist. I was not a big one. I was like, what am I going to do with the story? Am I going to be the first one who's going to release this? So you see in my Karzai book that came out in Dutch in 2009, I'm very modest about the surrender, simply because I'm too afraid to go against the narrative. It was super, super sensitive to say anything positive about enemy in 2009. You were seen as an apologist. And now there's much more body to that story. And now it is, uh, yeah, much more an accepted narrative. Now, how come that we overlook all these things? Well, how come we copy paste these things? How come that I was able to, in the end, find the hiding place of Mula Omar? And how come the CIA was not, or how come the New York Times was not? I think, um, there's one sheet I want to show you here, but which maybe explains a little bit why we miss so many stories, why we miss so many times the other side of the story. This is an uh, in the uh, Sciences Po uh, research we did uh, with students about the word terrorist camp in the articles, the New York Times, Washington Post, Reuters, and AP. And this is a mild outcome. I have to say. What you see here is that almost 45% on this story is Afghanistan is basically either coming from foreign government sources, which is 20% Pentagon. I can tell you that. Um, there will be more reasons later, but the what, what the 20.4 uh, sources mean, percent sources is very much Amer American government, anonymous officials, Pentagon, anonymous. CIA anonymous officials and so on. Then in this story, which is 2000, oh, are you, you hear me? Then there is a 45% uh, uh, local government sources, which is often the, the Afghan government. So basically you see that almost 45% of the sources is speaking the same language. It's all security. This 45% is the Afghan government. It's mainly the police and the army or the military, uh, the, 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 the Minister of Defense. Sorry, this is in Dutch. I'm sorry. This is 40 articles. Um, on a, on a only uh, now well this is a bit similar i think uh, it tells a little bit how it is possible that we have just such a, a one-sided idea how come that we can overlook a surrender of a terrorist group for example uh, how come that we don't know where mula omar was First of all, because we are staying on these camps and we listen too much to the American government and do not cross-check them. Second, we also do not try. The New York Times, as far as I know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Reuters, have never tried to find Mullah Omar structurally. I am the only one who wrote a biography on him in the world, on the Western part of the world. This tells you that there is like this narrative that's too dangerous, it's impossible, we know where he is, blah, blah, blah. And that, I think, that attitude, um, yeah, that attitude is a very, very big problem if you want to have neutral journalism. So that's, that's where I want to leave you for now. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a pointers uh, on 
on this. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, you can take it forward. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you're after. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ambrish, I think. Uh, yeah. It's maybe yeah. good for me to yeah. to point to to yeah. an. Yeah, I want to start from the latest. Uh, I mean, regarding whatever is happening in Afghanistan now, it is if you're keeping a track on that. Uh, for the last uh, more than a year, we have been hearing uh, that the US troops are withdrawing from Afghanistan. The talks also started with the Taliban, but uh, failed again and again. So can you throw some light? What are the reasons behind why the US talks with the Taliban are failing and why the US troops uh, withdrawal from the Afghanistan is getting delayed and uh, delayed again and again, whether there are some political connotations behind whether this is linked to the uh, pre US presidential election or I mean, what actually the scene behind? Yeah, I think uh, um, let me think what I am going to do with this because I, if you don't mind, um, um, I would like to go deeply into this, but I yeah. also would like to finish this presentation uh, off with this one concrete example of sourcing and what we actually know about the conflict, which is the, the, the UN uh, security report, basically the, the, the UN reports for, for, uh, for the UN Security Council. And, and Ibrahim is with us. So, so shall we do like 20 minutes of his uh, source analysis. Yeah, on... sure, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Because uh, and Ibrahim is a uh, much more better informed about the talks now than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ibrahim. Uh, Thank you for that, Betty. Thank you. Um, so I want to start off by pointing out that um, I do not come from a journalistic background. I'm uh, an Afghanistan observer. And as an analyst slash observer, I rely quite significantly on reports written by think tanks and research organizations. Um, to understand a complex situation, uh, such as the conflict in Afghanistan, we have to rely on a myriad of information uh, that includes sources from the news, that includes research done by think tanks and research organizations, and that includes research done by international organizations such as the UN. Um, I would like to point out that it is important to think critically about all material, including from such eminent sources such as the UN. Uh, one of my favorite genre of reports is that uh, they are rely on our UN reports on various terrorist and insurgent organizations. Uh, the UN generally has access to a vast array of sources and is in an ideal position to cross-check information through various sources. Uh, one such report is by the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team, which is generally published annually and contain the most up-to-date information on the Taliban and associated individuals and entities. So just to add some context, uh, in the past, the Taliban and the uh, Al-Qaeda were included in a single sanctions monitoring uh, mechanism framework. Uh, but in 2011, I believe it was decided by the UN that they would separate the Taliban as a separate entity and uh, Al-Qaeda as a separate entity. Um, so uh, here I'm talking about the latest one that's done on the Taliban. It was released uh, less than a month ago so at the end of May. Uh, I read these uh, reports in great detail as I believe the analytical support team has access to a lot of sources and is mandated to carry out its task in an impartial and balanced manner. It gives us the best opportunity to glimpse the internal dynamics of uh, organizations such as the Taliban and the impact that the, their surrounding environment has on them in terms of how they develop and how 
uh, the tra trajectory that they take. Uh, so last month, uh, as I said, the, um, this team published its latest report. I found this to be very different from previous reports. Uh, and I wanted to point out some of the basic differences I found this time. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly discuss some of the major segments of the report and what I found to be problematic with the report. Uh, the first, one of the first issues that I found with the report was that it contained some very basic errors. Uh, the report contained errors which could have easily been corrected with a proper proofreading and basic cross-reference. Uh, one such example was the, uh, in the annex provided with the report that outlined the administrative structure of the Taliban and identified their most senior members. Uh, the report uh, names individuals who make up the Taliban's senior leadership council or the Quetta Shura as it's famously known in the news. Uh, amongst the names it contains, uh, con mentions is um, Muhammad Hassan Rahmani. Now, according to the Taliban website, uh, Hassan Rahmani died more than four years ago. There's an obituary in the website that, uh, uh, for him that's published more than four years ago. Uh, and in fact, in the past, the analytical support team has uh, uh, mentioned that Rahmani has died and has consequently mentioned that they will be taking his name off the sanctions list. Uh, but here we are four years later, it's, that name has uh, reappeared. Another example was in paragraph 24 of the report, it mentions the Taliban's shadow governor for Badakhshan province, uh, who is named Kari Fasihuddin. Uh, and that he was killed in early September 2019. Uh, but it, it then includes the same person in the annex as the new shadow governor for Badakhshan province. So such basic mistakes can deviate against the information contained and bring the overall credibility of such reports under question. Uh, another, feature, uh, or another feature of the report was the lack of basic cross-referencing. So sometimes we see the, uh, uh, the report makes claims from single sources and fails to do due diligence in cross-referencing that information with other related sources. An example of this was the report's claim that Hamza Osama bin Laden, so this is Osama bin Laden's son, that he met with cer a certain senior Taliban members in spring of 2019 and that they reassured him personally that the Taliban would not break its historical ties with Al-Qaeda at any price. While the report mentions in its footnotes, uh, footnote, sorry, that according to news sources, Hamza's death was reported in the media in July 2019, it actually doesn't uh, make any attempt to address the claim that most US officials claim that Hamza was killed in 2016 or 2017. So uh, in other words, while the reports were published in July 2019, saying that Hamza had been killed, they say that US, uh, most of the reports point out that intelligence sources say that he was killed in 2016 or 2017. Whereas here the report is claiming that he met with Taliban in the spring of 2019, and then doesn't address this discrepancy in, the time, uh, in his time life or time, uh, lifespan. <clears throat> Another common feature uh, that we can point to is using the same information to reach different conclusions, or even perhaps we can say contradictory conclusions. Uh, so this can be best illustrated uh, when looking at the report's conclusions on the ties between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. For example, in the report summary, it states that relations between the Taliban, especially the Haqqani network and Al-Qaeda remain close based on friendship, a, a history of shared struggle, ideological sympathy, and intermarriage. However, in a previous report mapping the linkages between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and this is by the same uh, analytical team, by the way, this same team qualifies such statements by saying that the main links with the Taliban become, have become more local and tactical, and often reflect individual and personal connections rather than institutional ones. Uh, in another place in that uh, linkages report, it says that after more than 25 years of living in the same year, area, it's inevitable that there are many personal and some structural linkages 
between those individuals and groups who fight with the Taliban and those individuals and groups who are more closely aligned with Al Qaeda. So we are seeing the same set of facts and information in both reports, but they're being presented in ways where we're reaching mutually contradictory conclusions. And in the older report, that information is used to say that the uh, mechanism framework should be separated because there is uh, not a, a strong link between the two groups. But in this latest report, the same information is used to say that there is actually strong ties between the two groups. Uh, lastly, I just want to touch on another feature, which is uh, that the report makes claims where the prima facie evidence uh, militates against such a claim. Uh, and, and I want to use the Haqqani network and the ISKP uh, re, uh, nexus. So ISKP for reference is the uh, Islamic State Khorasan province. So that's the local, uh, uh, local chapter of the um, uh, ISIS in Afghanistan. Uh, the report establishes that there's accommodation between these two groups, the Haqqani network and the ISKP. The report employs vague terms such as one member state, uh, one member state stated, or some member states believe. Uh, Cross-referencing these claims with similar ones uh, made previously in public, one can establish that these claims were generally derived from the Afghan intelligence, uh, commonly known by the acronym NDS. Uh, such claims ignore many well-researched reports that demonstrate that ISKP has a strong urban and edu educated support base in Kabul, and it is mostly better positioned than the Haqqani network to carry out such attacks. In fact, just a few days before the report was published, Afghan security forces captured Abu Omar Khurasani, the previous ISKP leader inside Kabul, along with the group's spy chief and its public relations officer. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to add that the quality of UN report seems to have deteriorated over time and the analytical support team has limited itself by relying on single sources rather than seeking multiple sources of information. Uh, as Betty pointed out, most sources, including the UN, are overly reliant on certain parties and sources. Uh, and that can kind of build a one-sided narr uh, uh, narrative, which might not necessarily reflect the reality we see. The UN team uh, often visits compounds of intelligence officers in provinces such as Kandahar, but fails to arrange a visit to the Taliban front lines just a few kilometers away to cross reference and check basic facts and information. Uh, so that's all the information I wanted to add about the report. Uh, did you uh, want me to add anything else, Betty? Or? Betty, are you able to hear Abraham? I think she's on mute. Uh, but she ain't speaking anything. Yeah. Yep. Uh, can I ask one thing, Ibrahim? Sure. Yeah, my I'm Amrish. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, Betty. <laughs> uh, I was just at finish with my report mm -hmm. and wondering. Yeah, uh, I'm Amrish Satsena. I'm dean of the media school here, which is organizing this international conference. Yes. Uh, I want to ask the, uh, what is uh, the present scenario as far as uh, Taliban is concerned or US is concerned and the uh, present regime is concerned. Two important things which I would like to know about. One, the equation between Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah versus the US. What kind of political equations are there? If you can explain to our understanding. Uh, sorry, between uh, Ashraf Ghani or Hamid Karzai and Abdullah? Yeah, Abdullah. Ashraf Ghani and Hamid Karzai. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so between the present, two present, uh, uh, Abdullah Abdullah, who is now the head of the peace uh, effort, and Ashraf Ghani and the US? Yeah. And what kind of, uh, sorry, just to clarify the question. I mean, what, the, 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 this, this, this uh, political balance which is there in Afghanistan and yeah. how the US is dealing uh, with these leaders. That's basically yeah. I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, well, as you probably recall, in uh, 2014, after the uh, Afghan elections, we had uh, President Ashraf Ghani win the majority of votes by a very small margin, 
uh, but a majority nonetheless, uh, which were disputed by Abdullah Abdullah. Now, at the time, the uh, then US uh, Secretary of State John Kerry came to Kabul and arranged an agreement between the two sides so that they could work in a, a unity government. Uh, this time around when the elections came close, both parties were very insistent that they will not be repeating that same structure again. And after the elections, again, we saw Ash President Ashraf Ghani win the majority in the first round and Abdullah Abdullah refusing to uh, uh, accept that result. We even saw two separate presidential inaugurations. Uh, so it was a, for the media, it was quite a spectacle. Uh, yeah. uh, the uh, U.S. Secretary Pompeo himself personally visited uh, both parties and tried to resolve the con uh, the uh, uh, dilemma in a similar vein that John Kerry did. Uh, but it was very interesting from one perspective that he was not able to achieve the same result. And I think it kind of showed the uh, the eroding leverage the United States has in Afghanistan as it has begun. Uh, announce its intention to withdraw, and as it has started reducing its the resources it invests in Afghanistan, naturally it's losing the leverage it used to have in the past. And Pompeo was quite, uh, I would say, perhaps even frustrated because before he even left, he announced that the United States will be uh, uh, withdrawing one billion dollars worth of funds from the Afghan government. Uh, so uh, we are seeing a slight. Uh, we're seeing different visions by both parties. The United States, in a sense, wants to reach a, a rapid conclusion with the Taliban um, and, and wants to reach an agreement where they can withdraw as quickly as they can and, and let the Afghans sort their own problem, um, to, to use colloquial term. Whereas what, the, what exactly are the impediments as far as the withdrawal of the U.S. troops is concerned? Because again and again, we read in the news that the talks are on. Sometimes there is a, reported in the news that the talks have failed. Taliban is not coming to the terms as far as withdrawal is concerned. And a yeah. lot of time, political statements are made by the U.S. President Donald Trump regarding the withdrawal. Are there any connections of the U.S. troops' withdrawal with the election of the U.S. president? What exactly is the situation on the ground regarding this? Mm. Uh, well, that's. Uh, I think I can only speculate on uh, some of the decisions that are being made at the top level. But we saw that uh, in February of this year, we saw that there was a successful conclusion of an agreement between the Taliban and the U.S. Now, the terms were probably not something a lot of people were happy with but we had a conclusion nonetheless. Uh, we noticed last year in September, there, there, were, there was almost a conclusion reached between the Taliban and uh, Zalmay Khalilzadeh's uh, US envoy. But when the Taliban attacked uh, a US soldier, um, the uh, President Donald Trump kind of put everything on hold and said he will not be proceeding with. And there was also rumors that he had invited the Taliban to Camp David and they had refuse that, seeing that it would be seen as a capitulation in the public image of Afghans. So they had refused to uh, take that offer. Uh, but we, we've seen an agreement between the US and the Taliban. And judging from the text of the agreement, uh, the US has uh, conceded a lot more than a lot of people would have expected them to concede. And, and that kind of shows the US impatience with the conflict. It's the longest war in U.S. history. It's draining much needed resources, which are becoming, uh, becoming even more crucial with the uh, COVID-19, um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on U.S. economy. So we're seeing the U.S. is very impatient. Uh, as for the question you asked whether the U.S. would withdraw before the November election, I cannot say with certainty, but my inclination would be that while Tr President Trump would like to do take such a decision, I don't think the military establishment is ready for the. We already seeing uh, a lot of uh, contradictory reports in the media coming out. Some are saying that the Taliban are fulfilling their obligation as per the agreement. Others are saying no, they actually not. They haven't broken ties with the Al Qaeda in in public. They're not fighting Al Qaeda uh, militants in the areas they control. So there's different narrations, and I think that that could lead to a situation where there will not be a full withdrawal until 
and unless President Trump gets reelected in uh, November. Yeah, uh, there are reports in India. I mean, like, rather there are speculations in India in the political circles, and this is reported sometimes in Indian newspapers that once this uh, U.S. troops withdrawal happen, then the the present regime of Afghanistan will not be able to handle the situation, and that could result in the resurgence of uh, Taliban in Afghanistan. And again, Pakistan will have a bigger role in the affairs of Afghanistan. Is it so? Uh, Betty, I might let you take the lead on this and uh, given your extensive first-hand experience with both parties on the ground. I can't hear you, Ibrahim. Can you say again? Uh, I was yeah. just saying. Yep. Yes, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was saying that, that there are speculations in India that once the withdrawal of the US troops happen, then the present regime of Afghanistan will not be able to handle the situation there. And that might result in the resurgence of uh, Taliban. And then uh, there will again be a bigger role for Pakistan in the affairs of Afghanistan. Right. Um... You know, uh, Ambrish, I work now for 15 years on this topic, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, sounds like I'm super old, but that's okay. Uh, and I learned one thing. Um, I learned that in a complex environment, whatever, doesn't matter, it's also sometimes co complex elsewhere, it, predicting things is super difficult. Um, I find predicting, uh, of course, we can look at history. I can tell you a little bit what happened uh, earlier. Uh, but I can also tell you that there's always surprises in complex environments. Um, and and um, I feel like in the world of international affairs or international security, mainly uh, the think tank world and the expert world who come on televisions and tell you lots of stuff, it's so much like guessing, guessing, guessing that I feel like so, I find, that, I find that super, super difficult. I can tell you an example. Uh, my friend uh, Najibullah, who is my best friend from Afghanistan, from Tarinkot, has been kidnapped for one and a half years by the Taliban. Um, in those negotiations, I have seen a lot uh, with, the, with the Taliban and I've seen how they operate. I can tell you from that, from, uh, from the, those experiences that indeed I feel we are dealing uh, on the basis of those experiences, we are dealing with a movement that is divided. Um, there's a lot of egos in that movement with a lot of uh, agendas um, in provincial levels and stuff. Um, and I see also there is a movement that is convinced that they have the alternative for Afghanistan, that they have. So from also from talking a lot to Najibullah when he was basically with them for one and a half years, that, uh, yeah, he, he is very, he, he, before he went into kidnapping, <laughs> he was very much on the agenda of like, there might be a possibility of sharing uh, of several groups. Of course, Najibullah is now extremely traumatized from a one and a half year under the ground, basically in a cage. Um, but he also said that from, he, he said the, the guys, the, all these men he saw in those years were very hardened, like very angry also at the sitting government. Uh, many of them have lost personal help. People have lost family members, have lost, yeah, friends uh, have something to fight for. And uh, um, now, uh, that, that, that I think is, is super difficult. And in this context, uh, starting negotiations 20 years too late uh, with a movement that has so much confidence and gets even more confidence because the Americans fly private jets to Doha. Now, that's a bit exaggerated, but it's like a whole, like a whole scene in Doha. They, they get lifted. I was called the other day by one of the members in the, in, in, uh, in the Taliban team. Uh, 
and the, and the person just calls me and wants me on the phone like this. And I, I said, what is this attitude? I mean, I have a life, you have a life. You need to respect me, calm down. And so, yeah, the, I, I feel like we are, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, this is what I would answer to your question. Yeah, so another question I wanted to ask about embedded journalism, since you have been part of that, you told about your experiences and this whole term uh, came into existence uh, from the Gulf War, so since you have been in Iraq as well and then in Afghanistan. So with the, all your experiences uh, with regard to embedded journalism and then you are pursuing independent journalism. So can uh -huh. you... I mean, further explain this to our clarity, the difference between embedded journalism and the independent journalism with all your experience and how this difference exists in the West and how in the Asian countries in Afghanistan or in other parts of the world. Ah, yeah. Well, I think the lecture was indeed, uh, my idea was to basically let literally have you on my 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 adventure from living and being completely embedded in the western narrative in a family that is very pro-america mm. to moving and living for many years in kabul um and uh so i think that is a very strong experience uh that is hopefully inspiring others to to never stop cross-checking to indeed a story never has one side. You basically are gonna kill characters if you only if you only talk to one side of the story. You can better become a government if you do that. Um, so now I think we have a massive problem in the US uh, with this. The US uh, logically, US media mainly talk to US government very, very biased towards the elite in Washington. So their voice is ruling the world. There is a, there is a self-censorship that is so dangerous um, and that I would like to create awareness about in the future. Um, and and for, for your question about like, for example, Afghan media, which I know uh, partly, um, I, I also see that they are very much following the war on terror agenda. The Tolo News, uh, we also, Tolo is the big uh, television station in Afghanistan, hardly interviews Taliban, hardly interviews another side of the story. It's very loyal to the government. Understandably, because you, you know people from the government, right? You can just take the car and have an interview easy to talk to them, you speak the same language, uh, you live in the same city, so if you need to be fast, then okay, done. Let's talk to the governor of Kabul instead of like, maybe a, a district leader in Khost, um, or, you know. So, I mean, journalism needs a substantial rethink to include more voices, basically, uh, and, and to inspire. Also, like, yeah, I was talking to a Mexican the other day, uh, no, sorry, Brazilian, and he said, I also see our media is constantly looking to the American media to the, in their selection. So yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a, yeah, copy-paste so, behavior. But yeah. Can you tell us something about uh, what is the status of the local media in Afghanistan? Ooh, Ibrahim needs to help me. Um, well, um, I one of my students, uh, Amrish did analyze the reporting on Tolo television, the biggest television station in, I would say, Ibrahim, eh? in, in Afghanistan. I would say Tolo is or either one of the biggest or the biggest. One of the biggest, absolutely. Easily. Okay. Yeah, Ibrahim, can, you, can you tell us uh, something about the, the local media of Afghanistan? Uh, well, in Afghanistan, um, we, we're lucky in the sense that there is no uh, clear monopoly on the news. So there is the ability uh, for a lot of varied sources to come and uh, disseminate information. Over the years, Tolo News has definitely emerged as one of the stronger and more influential news uh, media, but there are other. And recently, we're also seeing new emergence of new media. For example, the RTA, which was the official government media in the uh, 60s and 70s, has made a strong presence, including in the social media. 
and we're also seeing some new uh, smaller medias that are emerging. For example, Zawiya Media is very much um, focused on the social media, uh, propelling its profile. It reached the other day, it reached over a million followers on Facebook. So it is, um, we, we, we have different sources, but I'll definitely uh, support Betty's um, statement that for them to thrive, they need to be on good terms with the government and they need to toe the official line. Just the other day, uh, actually, I think it was yesterday, I saw uh, RTA, the government media, had quoted Sohail Shaheen, who is the spokesman of the Taliban's political office. And there was a lot of reaction on the social media saying, have you guys now become the mouthpiece of the insurgency? Oh, so really? He, yeah, so just uh, just retweeting uh, the Taliban or giving their side of the story can cause uh, trouble for a lot of the media. So they're very, very, uh, 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 um, I suppose you can say self-censoring when it comes to that aspect of reporting on the conflict. Yeah, and Betty, as uh, you decided to have a talk on basically the war mongering or the war cry that uh, we find in the Western media, and incidentally, the same is the situation in India. All major television channels in India, they are always reporting in a manner wherein they are trying to instigate the government to be at war either at, uh, with Pakistan, earlier it was Pakistan, nowadays it's uh, China. So why this whole media, whether it's of the West or in the Asian media, the Indian media, why they are always full with this war crime? Interesting. So you basically say that, uh, see, my, basically by interviewing, they only, uh, basically 70% of your sources is the Pentagon, you will interview a military strategist who thinks about the world as w war, no war. Um, so it's indeed reflects like constantly the enemy, the other, it reflects constantly on taking or withdrawing or the world is, is, is like a game uh, if you constantly interview the security sources. Is that what you mean? Is that what you also see in India? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we, yeah uh, I, I, I have a question. Yes, yes. yes. So, Betty, <laughs> ma'am, I've been obsessing over you since yesterday, since you said that you will be accepting this, uh, because I've been pursuing you from so long. So, I, I saw oh. all your, yeah, TED, TED, uh, TED uh, video, also many other interviews. So it got me thinking when uh, when uh, you uh, went ahead and met uh, terrorists, uh, I, I just started thinking that what kind of challenges did you face? Were you not scared as, in, mm -hmm. uh, as a journalist and then being a woman? I mean, did you not feel, uh, feel any, like, did you encounter any threat? How was that experience and everything? No, I think one of the points, um... The way I worked, uh, and, and also the point I did a little bit in my introduction, is that first of all, first of all, it was really doable to work in Afghanistan. You only, like your colleague said, read about explosions, explosions. Now, there were, if there is in one or like in three months of life, in your life, there's one explosion, there is also the other days that you will not cover the press decides not to cover it so you constantly get the emotional fire explosion suicide bombers and so on there was much more now in that the other three months the other days of the the non-explosion days i could do a lot um I, I i could do a lot also as a female honestly i think there is a lot of things to say about the 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 role of women in Afghanistan and uh, sure in Pakistan and India, that's sure there is. Uh, I've I've met women who do not come out of their home only to go to funerals. Uh, yeah, that's uh, now at the same time in this uh, experience, I also felt a lot of respect for me, for me because I am a woman, and for me also because I tried. 
I try to speak to them and I try to go and drive and see there and, and listen to them and not go away, just come back and listen again and again and again. And I think that that's, that has created a beautiful snowball effect from all the, the, there was a lot of respect back and forth now. So in, in that sort of respectful situation, I did not see anybody as good or bad. I just saw people and I just wanted to know why, why do they fight? And so, yes, if you go in Kandahar and you have to, in your burka, indeed, you drive in a car and you need to go to an empty building outside of the town. And, and because that's the only place that the Taliban fighter wants to come, you trust on your Afghan colleague. I've been there for 15 years now. And I, I mean, that's the best. You, you know them. We, we, we laugh about it. We strategize. We, we, we are angry. We have all sorts of things that you do before you set a step in a complex environment. And 90% and of the times we would be agreed to go, uh, really. Uh, so g let that be clear. Uh, there is there, try, try, try. That's what I want to say. And I was very positively um, impacted by it and had all this access. So one, one other point I want to say is that uh, the Karzai book we published in Afghanistan as well, which means in 2014, I found an amazing publisher, Ajmal Azam, who published in Pashto and Farsi. Now that, that created such a launch of me as a personality so when I was in Kandahar two one and a half years ago I noticed like I just calling them and say bet dumb oh bet dumb I just immediately jump in the car and and see her because ev like so many people read the book about the president um so that also like that that gives you and it was the biggest compliment I got is that when this I gave readings for 400 people in Kabul that people were accepting what I've written. I mean, I, I come from outside, so I tried hard to make a story about the president with 150 sources, and it was not, it was not, it was, it was there. It was not a, a strange story to the people that I was writing about, which is a big accomplishment. Um, so, uh, no, it's a, it's a benefit to be female, I would say. Uh, it's a lot of respect and, and yeah. I, for me, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and there's much more possible uh, to, to see, see the terrorists. And, and, and that definitely works also a little bit with the snowball effect, you know, like you speak to one and then he says something. And then I was like, I want to know a little bit more about that. Then he said, okay, well, let me make a phone call. And then you roll on. Uh, so yeah, then you come in the outskirts of, of uh, weird places, yes. <laughs> Okay, another one uh, related to your book. So your book was quite controversial. So what was the international reception, especially from the Western media? Yeah, what yeah, the it? Mullah Omar book. That's yes. a, yeah, the second yes. book. Yes. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> so I mean, I think um, uh, the Omar book, um, which came out in March last year, no, April. Um, what happened? So the outcome of the book was going against the war and terror narrative that Omar was a faraway person, unreachable, dangerous, and orchestrating the insurgency and hosted by Pakistan, the, the big enemy. All these things, I ticked the box and I, I introduced another story and introduced another narrative by basically talking and, and really, this was a five-year project. It was not easy uh, to find him. This was only the outcome of five years investing, blah, 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 and understanding Mullah Omar as a character, too. And indeed, the, the, the outcome was against uh, mainly, yeah, the U.S. government, but also surely the Afghan government, who always portrayed the most wanted terrorist in Pakistan and as a strong insurgency leader fighting against the West and the Afghan government, basically. Um, so yeah, that, that created a storm. I've never had uh, so those two weeks before. I mm. was attacked. 
het is een lot. Uh, online, of course. Uh, very tough. You see also, just to make the journalistic point again, you see that mainstream media, then when the Kabul government, uh, sorry, the Afghan government called me uh, delusional, basically. <laughs> so that <laughs> I am delusional. So then you see that the coverage of the me media is then more leaning towards this statement than towards my research. They're like, but yeah, so you see now again the sort of re re reliance on the institutions and and not on this report uh, with quite a lot of sources, very transparent reports. I would say you could kill it if you have another source. You 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 know where to to sort of like insert that or come with counter counter information, uh, but uh, yeah, that happened to me and I I, uh, I survived. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yeah. How, how do you support uh, your journalism? I mean, are you associated with some organization and paid for that? Or how do you do it? Yeah. Until 2012, uh, I was on a, a stringer contract in Afghanistan. So I had a minimum salary uh, from a newspaper. And uh, that is also, and, and then I, I wrote the book on Hamid Karzai and, and so on, all that happened in that first period. Then I left the newspaper because I wanted to be on my own and write this Mullah Omar book. Uh, and that was not too difficult for me because the reputation of the Karzai book was quite good. So it was easy for me to apply for grants. Uh, so it was a minimum life standard which you also have to embrace as a journalist. Sometimes you go with the car to the machine in the supermarket and it's no money, um, which is fine. It's also romantic in a way. Uh, if you are good, you will make it. There's no way, there, there is a way for good journalists, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I managed and now, uh, now I'm fine, yeah. And, and what are your plans for future as a journalist? Uh, so, um, Basically, I want to shift a little bit towards the developing a plan to make this big American newspapers act differently and be more neutral and less relying on on the American sources. So I, that, that's a, that's the a process. It's a process of change. It's a process of dialogue. But I've seen that. Uh, I don't think we want to create war as media. And, and, and I really address that. So that's not really like day-to-day -day journalism, but more like thinking about our profession and how we can get back to normal. And there is a, there is a whole, uh, I mean, this industry involved, I mean, behind this war mongering, where in the, the, the companies which uh, manufacture arms and sell arms, whether they have a nexus with the government and uh, then uh, with the media houses, what kind of connection is this, if you can make out that? Yeah, I think uh, I want to, um, so basically this just started. I feel, I know that this, this idea is there, that there is a military complex uh, the, that that's sort of like that definitely is a dominant actor in in washington dc no question about that there's lots of think tanks that are funded by weapon producers that's all open in the internet there's no conspiracy but it is happening um now what is a media uh representative who is based in for example the capital Kabul. Does he is he impacted by this world uh, of of weapon producers of pro military industry actors, uh, or is there something else? Is why, why does he decide to only be basically speak to pro war on terror narratives? Why does he do that? Uh, and and I think it's more complex. I think uh, it is also to do with lack of time. It's also to do with scoring. It's also to do with lack of interest sometimes. Uh, there's also to do with arrogance. Um, it's also to do with being safe, not to be drunk to the court, you know, if you make an article, uh, a mistake in the article. So uh, that all needs to be discussed and the outcome needs to be changed. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Yashasika, uh, will you uh, please carry yes, on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, uh, there's just one, there, there, there's this question on behalf of my students. So, what yeah. are the ethics of what reporting that the journalist should keep in his mind? What, what if, for example, be it embedded or they're going like you went independent, what are the things that one should keep in mind while in war reporting? Because there are casualities and everything. So what do you think uh, should be the ethics of war reporting? Yeah. Now, for example, uh, I, like uh, if you have a local conflict and we can have, we have some at the moment in, in your region. Uh, yeah. And I would say if you go there and you have a very tense situation, where armies attack or borders are at stake or land is confiscated and you come in from sometimes or often far, you're new. Realize that you're new. Be humble, really, be humble. You are stepping in a theater that 90% you do not understand. Hmm. There's lots of spoke, spokesperson who want to influence you from ISIS, from Taliban, from China, from the US. Everybody wants to talk to you. Mm. That's fine. They can talk to me. But I listen and I listen with a certain ear. And so you take your time, you're being humble. Those things are very important. And be humble in what you write. If you need to produce within the first two hours, then May, maybe try not to produce. <laughs> try to tell your editor, no, 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 we don't need to be first. Why would we be first? Why eat hamburgers if you want to have a five-star meal? Mm -hmm. Hamburgers is not, not so nice. Um, but anyway, if he forces you to, to produce, which is often the case, then just write down the, the situation. 15 people dead. It's unknown who killed them. Villages are closed off of water, blah, blah, blah. That's it. Do not do any, do not be political if you don't know. It's too often that we jump to conclusion saying it's possibly ISIS, it's possibly India, it's possibly Pakistan. This, the governments love it, I can tell you. Hmm. But I don't think it's journalism. Uh, you need to be the smartest in the place, really. Journalism is the most difficult job there is in the world, really. Hmm. It's really, really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, skepticism is uh, very important for reporting uh, during uh, wars. And what, what is the impact on, you know, victims of war? You've seen it, like, for example, for us, we've seen, uh, for example, what happened in Iraq, then Syria, then Afghanistan. Not never, of course, uh, since this is not a conflict, travel area. So what is the impact? And uh, I feel that sometimes that uh, journalists are uh, quite insensitive while reporting about them and everything. So do you think that they should be a little sensitive uh, or should tread with caution while reporting about victims? Well, so basically, you want to report about the victims of victims. war. Yes, victims of war. Right. Yeah. I think it's very, very important if you put them in the right context, indeed. I think that's a, you cannot, if, if you have a beautiful, complete story, then yes, uh, you know, you start with the story of the bodies and how they were unrecognizable and how, and then sort of unwrap the story to the shooter. The shooter was from so and so, and he was sent by so and so, and then you make it a bit an, an, an anatomy of of the story, and and now this is in a luxury situation where you have the time. I think, and I see there is a question that war here in the chat. War has to war reporting has to be immediate. I would say says who, really? I think the biggest enemy in our reporting in general and in war is time. The, the, the hurry. The yeah. hurry is dangerous, really. We need to get over that. There's nobody interested in hurry. Mm -hmm. Nobody. The reader is not, the editor is not, the journalist is not, the victim is not. Nobody. 
just one more question that how is your teaching experience different from your journalistic experience <laughs> i must say i love i love teaching i uh, i i have a at Ciospo, uh, 12 weeks we talk only about this about how to report and how to see un reports how to uh, and it's a, it's a luxury i mean it's a luxury to be in paris and to have these uh, students there. I would love that the university would be more mixed and more diverse. I criticize that heavily and openly, um, but yeah, I like to have the class with me and, and, and I stay with them. We are, we are still talking all my, my years. We are in contact, they are all over the world now. So um, it's, it's a big part of my life now, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, sir, Ibrahim, sir. Uh, indeed, this was a very informative session. We learned a lot of things related to war reporting, terrorism, and personally, it's a paradigm shift for me. I will be more skeptical of the news being reported. Thank you so much for your time. Before we commence the session, I would like to inform that tomorrow we have technical session seven, public health, healthcare, and happiness and technical session eight, agenda setting issues of marginalized popular culture and youth. Additionally, we have a panel discussion on Desi flows, social media storytelling across ethnoscapes expressing the in-between of Indian diaspora, which will be moderated by Dr. Amrit Saxena, Dean of the MA Media School. And the panelists will be Dr. Vikrant Kishore and Dr. Martin Paul. I would like to end this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right